Welcome to the top 10 Jewish composers. The School of Jewish Music at Boston's Hebrew College presents a series of educational podcasts and a concert looking at the most prominent composers of music with Jewish content. This program, the final program in our first series, explores concert music from the past six decades. Composers from America and Israel who expressed their identity as Jews or as Israelis in symphonies, chamber music, and choral works. I'm Josh Jacobson, Senior Consultant for the School of Jewish Music at Hebrew College, and your host for this podcast. We have with us today two composers who have chosen to express themselves Jewishly through the art of composition. Meira Warshower's works have been performed to critical acclaim throughout five continents. Her music has been featured on American public media's performance today. Meira's musical palette is wide, ranging from traditional Jewish prayer modes to minimalist textures with rich melodic contours, and from joyful jazz-influenced rhythms to imaginative orchestrations of the natural world. Dr. Warshauer has served on the faculties of several colleges and universities. She currently resides in Columbia, South Carolina. Greg Wall is an accomplished saxophonist and performs frequently at top venues and major festivals throughout North America and Europe. Greg is equally fluent in the jazz and music and world music idioms and has made many session appearances for record dates and film scores. His compositions for jazz, dance, and electronica have been widely performed and recorded. His critically acclaimed release, From the Belly of Abraham, with Hasidic New Wave and Senegalese master drummer's Yakar Rhythms, was recently named one of the 10 best CDs of the year by Jazz Times magazine. I'd like to start with uh, Meira, and perhaps you can describe one or two of your compositions that have Jewish content and tell us something about the journey that took you there. Well, thank you. First of all, I'm, I'm so happy to be part of this project, the, the Top Ten Jewish Composers, and it's a, you've presented a very fascinating subject and a fascinating perspective. I was uh, called to be a composer uh, while I was studying music at New England Conservatory. I was a pianist, and I, and I was just fascinated with composing, and I switched into composition. I think at that time we were searching for personal language. So um, when I heard the block, Sacred Service, I thought, you know, there's so many masses, so many settings of the uh, Christian service. Maybe there's room for another Jewish service, another one of the same scope like of the block. Well, let's listen to a little bit of the piece you just described. What, what are we listening to? Or Hadash. Greg, I'd like to address the same question to you. Tell us something about what you're writing and, and how you came to your journey from writing jazz to writing Jewish or Jewish jazz. I couldn't really put my finger on a, a particular time where I started identifying as being a Jewish composer. I consider myself uh, an improvising composer. I write primarily to give myself a, uh, an environment within which to, to, to do my spontaneous composition. My music sort of parallels my own spiritual journey. And I, uh, I don't really see it as, as uh, putting on like a Jewish mode, okay, now I'm gonna write with these scales or something like that. It's more, uh, emotion-based, I think, for me. Uh, I often play for my students uh, your experiments with uh, playing the haftarah, the chanting of the prophetic portion, uh, while reading from the, the Bible, but you play it on the saxophone instead of chanting it. 
So the, I mean, there's kind of a direct connection to the tradition. So that was that, that particular project was uh, sort of documenting a, a phase I was going through. I, my, my son, my oldest son, who uh, just turned 18, was getting ready to, to work uh, for, towards his bar mitzvah. So I was teaching him to chant the Haftarah. And uh, I decided that um, I would have um, a little fun with, uh, with the Trump and try to fantasize how the music would sound if I was able to be in an environment that had live music accompanying the Haftarah. But it started off just with me playing and trying to, to get the, the sound of the Trump on my instrument and trying to have some kind of, of, of unity and to hear instead of uh, text-based um, inflections, more, more personal saxophone based inflections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're gonna need, well, let's, let's listen to uh, a very short uh, piece, which is my interpretation of the uh, Pasuk in, in Malachi uh, that I first was familiar with at my bar mitzvah. And uh, it, it opened the doors to a lot of different things for me. Great. What's the title of this? Uh, I just call it Malachi. Okay, let's listen. Greg, I want to I want to comment on some of my experience with with using trope in, in composing also, um, and I've also found that a doorway uh, to really great depths. Um, I had I was commissioned to write uh, some music for a, a trio, a piano trio for p violin, piano, and cello, and I was starting it in the late summer, and I always go to Tisha B'Av service and. I always loved, I always loved the echa, the, the, just the longing of that, uh, that trope. And it, it, it takes me a while to compose. It's not just improv improvising. I mean, I have to, it takes me a while. So I was started it in, in late August, and then we're going through the Chagim. OK, now it's in Sukkot, so we're supposed to be Zman Simchatenu, right? The time of our joy. We're already we left. Tisha B'Av is already in August. Now we're in September. It's not that long when you're writing a trio, but <laughs> that was a very hard fall because I stayed in Tisha B'Av mode until November. Uh-huh. I hope to be able to hear it. Uh, are, are you going to be sharing could, a little with us today? We could play an excerpt of that, sure. Yeah, the yeah, opening. Um, I also yeah. uh, recorded uh, a, a piece that's based on Echa as well. It might be interesting to I'd love to hear that. our uh, viewers to be able to, to hear both of them. Well, let, let's hear a little bit of it. Uh, first, Meira's uh, trio. Now let's hear a little bit of Greg's piece. What's the title, Greg? It's called uh, Lamentations. When you play your music, and let's say somebody who doesn't have your background plays your music, can you hear a difference? Does somebody have to come from this intense Jewish background to perform what we're calling Jewish music? No, not necessarily. But again, as, as I explained earlier, that for the most part, even with my most intricate compositions, it's usually setting the stage for some type of uh, improvisational composition. Mm -hmm. And 
that's really more about simpatico than anything else. And you know, to, being able to share a, uh, this collective experience, I feel, just frees me up to, uh, to, to really reach down deep and, and get out everything that uh, I'd like to express. Mira, how that's about it. you? You're when, when your music is performed, what kind of reaction do you get? I, th I think it's impossible for anyone who doesn't speak Hebrew to have that depth of understanding of the text. But I hope that it, it could be transferable. I mean, the audiences definitely get it. Mm -hmm. and, and they played it all over this country and Canada. Mm -hmm. and so it, it has an appeal to an audience whether or not they are a Jew. Yeah, you can sense it. Uh, Greg, turning back to you, I, I'm going to throw something out that's maybe way out in left field, but we made a decision uh, that for this series we would deal only with classical music, and I'm using my two fingers, um, and at some point we decided jazz is America's classical music, and it should be not be put into the category of pop music, but it should be in, in classical. Uh, you and, and Zorn and, and a bunch of others are doing I think um, amazing things with Jewish music, um, interfacing with jazz and improvising styles. Can you talk something about that, about how classical your music is or, or not, uh, how you see it? I believe that uh, I, I'm much more comfortable with the, the category of, of art music, music designed to be uh, pondered, to, to, to be not only to be enjoyed, but to be studied, uh, something that's designed to be listened to more than once, maybe listened to more than twice, uh, and which which demands something of the listener. To me. So I, I think that that's something that all any serious composer, whether they call themselves classical or call themselves jazz, if they really want to have an encounter with the audience and wants the audience to bring something to the table, then I, I believe we're, we're talking about the same approach to music making. Uh, and in, in this day and age, one of the, the, the advantages of being part of a global digital society is that there are no artificial boundaries anymore. We have instant access to anything. I'm too restless to, to, steal, to stay in any one genre too long. I know Zorn feels exactly the same way. Although I, I, I love to listen to people who call themselves classical composers and see themselves as, uh, as, as an extension of the Western European tradition. Meira, you speak about the universal message of Jewish tradition that comes through your music. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I, I tend to try to ask the big questions. Um, my symphony, Living, Breathing Earth, is dedicated to the whole earth and the situation that we're finding ourselves in where the earth, we can't take the earth help for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was a, a huge uh, expression of is coming from the Jewish you know, value of life and appreciation of creation, of being part of creation. And when that symphony was premiered, um, I was um, searching for the next step uh, what would actually uh, shake us up. We all want to wake up to the next level, but we need some help getting there. We're creatures of habit. So I, I just, I turned to the shofar um, because that, to me, what else could wake us up to our core in terms of sound? Let's, let's yeah. before we go on, let's listen to a little bit yeah. of this piece so we can yeah. hear the sound of the shofar. Hear some of the beginning of that. Do you want your music to change people's lives? Yes. To make the world a better place? Yes. <laughs> I want to change my life. Yeah. And does <laughs> and, it? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, when I write music, I, I feel like when it's really, and maybe you feel this way too, Greg, 
Um, and you probably feel this when you're conducting. I mean, you feel like you're entering into the shefa, the flow, uh, the divine flow. It's there. Greg, reacting to something you said earlier about sometimes you just want to listen and be inspired by the musical experience. Um, I know there are times when I'm in a concert, uh, whether I'm performing or even just listening to a Mahler symphony, let's say, and it takes me into a very spiritual place. And there are times when I'm in shul in the synagogue and I find it very difficult to get to that spiritual place. The music is just not doing it for me. Is, what can we do? What can we do to make that connection? Is there, is there a place, you think, in shul, in the synagogue, for, for listening? I believe there absolutely is. I think at times like that, though, uh, what works for me, is I don't, I don't go to the synagogue particularly for a, a, a musical type of listening experience, but I, I, I try to work on my inner listening and, I, and to really feel like I'm in a, uh, a divine dialogue. It's hard to do, easier to say than to experience. But once you've experienced it, uh, it, 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 it bodes well for future experiences like that. Let, let me turn that around a little bit and say, are there times when you are performing or listening to music, but let's say performing, that you feel that spiritual experience? Is it, is it at all related to what you feel when you're davening? Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll, and it's, you know, when Mira was talking about that, that flow, uh, that's exactly what I want to do, and I, you know, I, I find that if um, I, I, I can't put my finger on when I'm going to experience it, but if, if I've been, I, I usually experience it if I'm on the road uh, and I'm traveling, I'm in Europe or something like that, where I have absolutely no responsibilities other than showing up to the concert hall and playing, and, and usually when in, when I have no distractions and I'm not involved with all of the minutiae of day-to-day -day life, uh, those moments come a lot closer together. Uh, and I find when the flow's not there, then that's, you know, then the intellect takes over, which is not necessarily the most satisfying experience to have. Yeah. Yeah. You have to find the balance. Well, Greg and Meira, this has been a wonderful conversation. I thank you for being with us. Um, this program was produced by Hebrew College and recorded by Robert Craig. Thanks for watching.